Thanks for joining us for another Contagion Coronavirus video. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Robert Salata, who will be discussing the ARMS-1 investigational drug for COVID-19. Thanks so much for joining me, and why don't we just get started? So my first question for you is to start, can you summarize this investigational drug? It's been around uh, for a while, since 2012. And in the mid-2000 uh, period of time, we uh, were very um, enticed by the uh, laboratory evaluation of this drug against a variety of uh, different microbial pathogens. So it has potent activity against bacteria, fungi, and in this respect, we're looking at viruses. So they've already shown uh, others, our colleagues, that um, this works very well in the laboratory against uh, influenza and other respiratory seasonal viruses. And on top of that, there was a publication in the summer of 2019 by our Chinese colleagues that looked at, uh, at the activity of this antiseptic called CPC. Uh, and it's quite like chlorhexidine, which many of our, your viewers will be familiar with. And um, this in the laboratory showed potent activity as well against other coronaviruses. We didn't have COVID-19 around at that time, but against the first SARS virus, coronavirus, as well as MERS uh, and other coronaviruses that are common causes of the cold, uh, and it did show potent activity. In parallel with this study, which we'll describe in a few minutes, uh, we are undertaking studies at Case Western Reserve University with our basic science colleagues as they uh, attain the um, capability of growing the virus in the laboratory, and we will test this product uh, definitively against uh, this virus as well. But with that as a great start, um, and the fact that there really are not great preventative uh, measures for COVID-19 right now, uh, and because we need to preserve our workforce, healthcare workers, uh, this was the basis, the nidus, for our uh, initiating this study. This product contains this antiseptic, and in our previous work, uh, when it's sprayed into the mouth, we know through animal models that it does penetrate into the nasal area, and that's important in terms of where this, this and other respiratory viruses live. Uh, and it also has what is called mucoadherent activity, meaning it, it stays very avidly uh, bound to the nasal and oral mucosa, and therefore um, it's ideal in this regard. So in the previous studies, and by the way, we did another one in about 40 of our bone marrow transplant patients to look at what effect this product had on the acquisition of very resistant bacteria in the oral area. And in both studies, the first one, which was with 100 individuals that were otherwise healthy, and in the bone marrow transplant patients, it was very, very safe. There were no side effects at all. Uh, so that's important as a starter. So we felt, going back to this investigation, that we wanted to provide something to our frontline healthcare workers. And with the idea that we think this will uh, reduce the occurrence of uh, COVID-19 disease and, and also shorten the course of disease if they do acquire it. Uh, that's what we're uh, starting to do. It is a randomized, controlled, blinded um, crossover study, placebo controlled, so that in the first two months, and we're gonna study over 4,000 individuals, um, and multiple institutions will eventually be involved because that's a lot of folks to recruit. Um, we will uh, randomize to either the placebo arm or the active compound. And it's sprayed into the mouth three times a day. It's very pleasant tasting. It's not a big problem. And at the outset, we will measure uh, antibodies against the COVID-19 uh, virus so that we have a sense of what, it, what we call the prevalence of infection, even though people have may, may have been asymptomatic. But if they're positive by antibody testing, they will not be enrolled in the trial because they should be theoretically protected against COVID-19 going forward. Uh, we will also test by antibodies at the very end 
uh, and that will give us a sense of the incidence, the new infections that are occurring in that population of healthcare workers. And these are frontline uh, direct patient contact uh, folks. And anytime they develop a respiratory illness, they will be evaluated and testing for uh, COVID-19 will be pursued with PCR. Uh, and so we'll be able to uh, account for uh, how often they develop this and we'll look at both groups. So we, in the essence, we will have control groups in two ways. One will be uh, the placebo group uh, versus active compound, although it's gonna be crossed over as I mentioned. But we'll have the same individual serving as their own control, if you will, uh, because they'll move from one uh, form of treatment to the other. So that all said, uh, we anticipate that the periods of treatment will be 60 days apiece and then the crossover will occur. We'll have an interim analysis at that 60 day period. And if we find that it's very, very effective, then we may stop doing it in our healthcare workers and make it available more broadly. And secondly, begin to study it in other individuals that are at high risk for complications and death, such as the elderly and those vulnerable populations with chronic uh, cardiac, lung disease, diabetes, active treatment for cancer, immunosuppression, pregnant women perhaps, but probably we'll stay away from them at, at the end. So uh, that, was be, that would be our plan to escalate this to other groups ultimately uh, to see if it's, it's effective as well. So this would be our ability to see if it really is preventative. There are other products that are being uh, considered you know, in the prevention manner, but uh, this is a relatively simple and safe, uh, and we think going to be effective means to do this. So earlier when we were just getting on the call, you mentioned that, you know, you have to head to the hospital later on today. So I just wanted to ask, as an individual who, you know, is currently, you know, going back and forth to a hospital environment, why is it so important for us to be looking at medical countermeasures for COVID-19 for our frontline healthcare workers? Especially prevention again. So everybody has discussed the issues of the uh, dwindling supplies of personal protective equipment and other things that we can do to keep our healthcare workers safe and on the job because that's gonna be important as this spikes up. And we, are, we have been fortunate in Ohio not to see the uh, huge numbers of cases that have occurred in other areas like New York, New Jersey, Chicago, Detroit, among other places. So uh, I think that um, it's all about, you know, keeping our healthcare workers safe and at work and productive because we need them on the front lines, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Um, so do you have any final thoughts or conclusions about your study or anything else related to COVID-19 that you want to share? No, I, again, we want to do this as rapidly as we can. Uh, it's being finalized at the IRB level today, and this is one of the fastest processes I've ever seen. Uh, but uh, we want to roll this out. We'll have two other institutions initially uh, involved with us. Uh, because uh, to recruit that many individuals, as I said before, will be a Herculean task. But that's what it will take to show efficacy. And I think that's what it's all about. Great. Thank you so much for joining me. And we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. We wish you luck with your research. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.